let's get started. It's all for the good. Okay. <laughs> we are on page 292. And last week, we had finished paragraph 25, where we spoke about how a righteous person, a saintly person, deals with personal suffering in life, and how they learn to accept and to come to terms and to even thank God for many of the travails and the tribulations that, and tragedies that a person has to go through in life. Very, very difficult concept, and yet, that is what distinct is one of the distinguishing factors between a righteous individual and someone who's an ordinary individual. An exemplary individual uh, takes tra personal tragedy and uses it as a way of relating in some way to Hashem. Tries to find whatever they can, the silver lining in any situation. Um, but it's a again trials that people go through in life. There's no way to, uh, to judge, there's no way to determine whether everyone is capable of achieving that in every situation. But we have examples of some people who were able to go through extreme trials in life and were able to emerge. And we're able to emerge whole and close and very spiritual and feeling that connection to the Rebana Shalom. The, the next section that we deal with in paragraph 26 is really related, a direct offshoot of that previous discussion. And that is, it's one thing to relate to personal tragedy and personal trials and tribulations in life, but there's also another issue which has how do we relate to national tragedy and the condition of the Jewish people throughout history. You know, coming to terms with the Holocaust, for example is something that we still have difficulty, great difficulty with. Although with every, uh, every year that passes, it seems that two things are happening. Number one, the world is forgetting more and more. And number two, we tend, we are coming more to terms with how to articulate and express uh, and sort of indulge in the experience of what happened 70 years ago, 75 years ago. You know, when I was growing up, there was far less Holocaust awareness. Uh, I, think, I think that's true just about of anyone that's in this room. No, we, no, because where I live, all the parents were Holocaust survivors. But that's the point. My point is this. There were far fewer museums. There were far fewer exhibits. There was no Holocaust education. We were living it because our parents and grandparents were survivors. That's, that, that, was, that was the way that we commemorated the Holocaust. We didn't talk about it. We had no words yet to even express what had actually happened. There was no way. I mean, there would be, you know, Hogan's Heroes was on television, for goodness sake. There was a comedy about the Nazis. That was the only way, I mean, there, there were so few ways to actually unpack what literally had happened to 6 million, 11 million people, uh, Jews and non-Jews, and 6 million innocent Jews. So it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't part, it, it was, it, we hadn't yet put, we didn't yet have the vocabulary and the processing tools in the first generation after the Holocaust to be able to process it. Today, we are able to process the information much better. We're able to come to terms with the facts, with the reality of what happened, because distance, the chronological distance allows one to do that. But it also is a danger because, there, as we know, the rest of the world is now forgetting. I just saw an online poll that says like something like, uh, I don't remember the percentage, but it was a significant percentage of Americans under the age of 20 who have never even heard of the Holocaust. Don't even know that they, they don't, even know what, don't even know what the history was. So anyway, so that's, uh, but that's what he's dealing with in this paragraph, is, is dealing with the national tragedies and coming to terms with them. So the famous question, when we talk about the Holocaust is, where was God? 
And does, is this not a sign that Hashem has forsaken his people? And where was God? And, uh, and, uh, and we can go through historically, like we do on Tisha B'Av, and just review all that has befallen our people throughout the last 2,000 years and get a, also get a very dismal picture of the history of the Jewish people. And so, therefore, he says as follows, the above about coping with tragedy refers to personal tragedy, but the saintly person does the same for national tragedies as well. When confusing thoughts arise in his heart concerning the length of the exile, the scattered condition of his people, and their squalor and diminished numbers, he first takes solace by declaring God's acts as just, as I mentioned above. He then considers that suffering removes sin and ponders the hidden rewards in the world to come and the ability that we have to cling to the divinity even in this world. So what does he do? He says that the three the theodicy arguments are, number one, it's a kapara. We, the Jewish people, have required spiritual purging to atone for our national sins. And we know that this is an, there's an entire school of, uh, of midrashic literature that deals with this whole idea. The reason why the Jewish people are compared to the moon is the moon is constantly waxing and waning. The waning represents the diminishing strength of the Jewish people and their diminishing fortitude. Because every time we go through an iteration of persecution and tragedy, we've been purged in some way so that it enables us to wax again at some point in the future. So Hashem has punished the Jewish people throughout history in piecemeal fashion, which is the key to our longevity. With other nations, God waits until nitmala aha isa, until the measure is completed, and then utterly annihilates them. With the Jewish people, every generation there's a degree of suffering because Hashem wants to sustain us for, the, for, for perpetuity. And that's the reason why we go through iterations of suffering uh, in, in every or every other generation. That's the first argument. The, the next argument that he makes to come to terms with this is the rewards of the world to come. That this world is a corridor that, that as the mission Pirkei says, that leads to the grand ballroom of the world to come. And so therefore he takes solace in that, that we're just here in a temporary existence and that the real greatness of the Jewish people can only be realized in some f gr uh, grand future that we have yet to see. And the third solace, the third comfort that he provides for himself is that no matter what they do to my body, they will never destroy my soul. That a person has the ability, despite all different kinds of persecution, we can always cling to the divinity in this world. We can always find spiritual wholeness. Like the Kutzker used to say, there is nothing as whole in God's eyes as a broken person. When a person is broken, he is really whole. And so, and so therefore, uh, um, the way that a person uh, can come close to Hashem has nothing to do with our external physical conditions. Yes, suffering happens. You know, you, you just think about, you know, uh, Fiddler on the Roof and all of the, the, the exiles and the suffering and the persecutions that our ancestors, ancestors had to go through. And yet, the spiritual contact with Hashem in this world has always remained intact. And that's really what counts. So those are the three sort of consolation arguments that the righteous person is able to make for himself. Now, if his evil inclination still causes him to despair by arguing like the verse, can these bones come back to life, which is what God said to Yechezkel, Hatichyena atzamot ha'ele, do you think these bones can ever relive? God shows him the vision of the, in the, in, in the valley of the desiccated bones. Can these bones ever come back to life? Which is based on the fact that we have disappeared as a nation and have been forgotten. As it says, our bones have dried up, our hope is lost, we have been cut off. 
And it's very difficult for one who is in the midst of this state of dried bones to, to, to um, appreciate that there will be at some time a resurrection. Then he should contemplate the exodus from Egypt and all that is written in the song, Kama ma'alos tovos, la makom aleinu. Now, I, I want you to think about that for just a minute. Um, what he's suggesting is that if a person thinks about all of the current state that the Jewish people are in, now, this, is, may, this may not speak to our generation, because we are the generation uh, where Israel is a startup nation, where we are, you know, for, per capita, the most successful, the most prosperous nation in the world today, or at least one of the most prosperous uh, nations in the world today, the most, the most educated, behind Canada, that is, um, the most, uh, most high-tech, you know, the most uh, technologically advanced, the most militarily advanced nation, one of the most in the world. So it may be difficult to relate to this, but we have to recognize that this is being written several hundred years ago when the Jewish people were in the diaspora scattered and, and destitute and downtrodden. So, he says, you know, if that's bothering you, we're a bunch of dry bones, here's your consolation. Think of that song, Dayenu, that we sang at the Seder, and you'll immediately get a big perk. You'll get perked up. Now, I just wanted to ask a very simple question. Come, you know, the Dayenu is a very lovely song that we sing every Pesach. How many of you think about that on a regular basis to come to terms with the Holocaust? or to come to terms with other tragedies that have happened to the Jewish people. When you think about what he's saying, it doesn't even really make sense at face value, because it's true that the whole Dayenu song is how much gratitude we owe Hashem for all the things that he's done to us, but done to us in the past tense. What does that have to do with our current state of being downtrodden and a persecuted people? What does it have to do with anything? Kamamalos tovos lamoko maleyu. Ilu hotsiyanu mi mitzrayim. Velo asabahem shefatim dayenu. That would have been enough. Thank you, Hashem, for everything that you did to us. I mean, the gratitude that we have at the Seder is wonderful. But what is that, how does that address the dried bones of today? So, I'm going to answer that question in just a moment, but I just want you to think about the apparent um, uh, illogic of what he's suggesting here for just a second. Let's finish the paragraph and let's come back to this. It should not be implausible to him that we will return to our original state even if there is only one of us left. As it says, do not fear, worm of Yaakov. God calls us a worm, because this is all that is left of a person after he is dead and buried. This is a Pasuk from Isaiah, chapter 41. And the Pasuk says, Al tiri'i tola'as Yaakov mese Yisrael. Do not fear, O worm of Jacob. Mese Yisrael is translated in two ways. The conventional way of translating it is, those of the number of Israel, the number of Israel. Okay, but the Malbim actually translates it a different way. The Malbim translates it as Mese Israel, the dead of Israel, from the word mate. Like you can translate the word mete as by Hisham bimete maat, that the Jews were there of small number. Mete means of a number, but mete also could be read as mete, which means the dead of. So you are the worm of Jacob. That seems to be the way Rabbi Yudah Levi, at least it sounds like he's translating at it, because you're, the reason why I'm calling you a worm is because you represent like a rotting corpse. Uh, and ani azarticha nu'um Hashem, or rather ani azarticha nu'um Hashem, I am going to help you, says Hashem, v'go aleich kedosh Yisrael, and I will be your redeemer, O Holy One of Israel. So that's the Pasuk in Isaiah, and therefore don't despair. It's not implausible that even after so many years of being dried bones, 
you can still come back to life. And that will happen in the future. Now, the next question that we have is, why do you need to invoke a verse from Isaiah? We were talking about the passage in Ezekiel about the dry bones. We already have a passage that talks about resurrection. We know that God takes Ezekiel to a valley, shows him these dry bones, and says to him, do you think these bones shall live? And Ezekiel says, no, how can they possibly come back to life? And God shows him that the bones actually do come back to life. There's a dispute in the sages as to whether this event actually happened in real life or whether it was only a vision. But the point is, is that that in itself is an illustration that something that is dead can come back to life and can be resurrected. So the Jewish people, no matter how scattered and destitute and downtrodden we are, we can recover. So why then does Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi bring the verse in Isaiah that says, you can look at this verse that calls us a worm to show that we'll come back to life. You don't need the worm example to show us we'll come back to life. Go back to the dry bones. That in itself is the illustration. Yes? It seems to me like Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi is going a little bit off track because you're first discussing why B'nai Yisrael suffer in general and he's answering that with the, with the idea that you're suffering but eventually you'll come back to life. That's not the same thing. It's two separate ideas. Why do we have to suffer? Can we come back to life? One doesn't seem to am have answer the same as the other. Well, well, you, you're, you're, you're right. He's making two points. The first point is that if you want to come to terms with why we suffer in this world, I've given you three arguments. Okay, right? but now he's moving on to something different, and it seems. Then the next point is, if your evil inclination still tells you, yes, but we'll never recover from our current state, I can come to terms with why we suffer, but we're going to be suffering forever. How, do we, how can we ever recover from our current state? It doesn't seem to be possible. So the answer to that is the dry bones, Dayenu, and the worm of Jacob. You just have to look outside. Everything looks horrible. In two weeks, everything will be gorgeous and green. Like, you could understand that things can turn around. That question doesn't seem to Yeah, be well, it, it is still a little bit hard to understand when you consider world history. How many nations do you know have been completely eliminated and dispersed and yet are able to recoalesce and come back? The, the Jewish people are an anomaly to world history. Once a nation is dispersed and destroyed and dislocated from its land, that generally in world history represents an end of that civilization or culture, period. There are, I don't know, I mean, you'd have, we'd be hard-pressed to find other examples of this. I'm sure there are on a smaller scale than the Jewish people, but it's, uh, it's the exception to the rule and not the rule. But we just said in the Haggadah, like, to me, that's not even a question or a problem, because if God is omnipotent, he can make anybody come back from anything. Uh, true, uh, true. I mean, I, I think that... Um, it's hard to relate to this dilemma, as I said, it started off earlier, because we have it so good as the Jewish people. We have Medinat Israel, we have our own country, we have our own statehood, and it's a little bit hard for us to relate to the tremendous sense of desperation that Jews were experiencing 800 years ago. So, I just want to be able to help maybe perhaps explain the whole structure of the latter part of this paragraph. Um, when we think about what it means to be the worm of Jacob and how this explains everything, I think we'll understand why he's invoking Dayenu and why the dry bones is not in itself enough. The Radak tells us on this Pasuk, if you take a look at the Radak in source number two, he quotes the Midrash and it says, Lefi shehem chalashim begalut ketolaat. He says, the reason why the Jews are compared to a worm is because we are so weak in the diaspora that we're like a little worm underneath your foot that has no strength. It's a soft tissue. There's no, not even a vertebrae uh, in the, and there's no spinal column in this worm. And that's really the way the Jews have been in the Gullahs. Uvi Denu, there's a medrash called Medrash Ilam Denu, 
And it says, Lama nimshlu Yisrael letolaas. Why are the Jewish people compared to a worm? Lomar lecha ma tolaat zezu, ena ma ke et ha'arazim ela bepeh, vihi raka u ma ke et ha'kasha. Kach Yisrael kol kocham batefila, u ma kim rishei ha'olam shehem chazakim ka'arazim, venim shalim bahem shenemar erez balevanon. He says, the Jewish people are like this worm that on a physical basis is very weak but has a tremendous power to, what does a worm do with, a so, with its soft body and its soft mouth can chew into the hardest of substances and make big holes even in a cedar tree. Even in the hardest of organic substances a worm can eat its way through. And the, and how does it do so? With its mouth. It chews on the pulp and it's able to get its way through. The Jewish people are like a worm in that sense and that we don't have strong physical strength in the diaspora, but we have the power of our mouths. We can use the power of prayer to call to Hashem to fell our enemies. And that is the key to our success is that when we connect to Hashem with our mouths through tefillah, then we are able to destroy even the strongest cedars of the enemies of the Jewish people. That's what the Midrash says, why we're called the worm of Jacob. But I found something fascinating that expands on this in the Zohar. The Zohar tell, and I just brought, I got you the English translation just because it's too hard to go through the whole Aramaic and translate it. The words are very difficult. The earlier part of the Zohar in Parshas Vayishlach talks about the power of the other nations. And then it contrasts the power of the other nations to the Jewish people. And it says, Israel, on their part, have no force or power to overcome them, their, the enemies, the other nations of the world, save in their mouth, like to the worm, which has no strength or power except in its mouth, by which, however, it wears through everything. Hence, Israel are called worm. So that's what we just saw in the Radak, right? Or, again, as the silkworm. I love this analogy. The word tolat can be just a regular worm that you see after a heavy rain in the summer, but it could also be referring to a silkworm. And what does a silkworm do? It manufactures the finest fabric, right? This, that precious creature which produces from itself a fine thread out of which is woven the costliest kingly raiment leaves behind before it dies a seed out of which it comes to life as before. So what is he referring to? You know, a, a silkworm. What happens to a silkworm after it builds a cocoon for itself? It becomes a butterfly. That's the tola'as that is being referred to in Isaiah. So Israel, although they seemingly die, always re-emerge and persist in the world as before. So scripture says, behold, as the clay in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. We say this as part of the liturgy of Yom Kippur, if you recall. Ki hinei kachomer biyad hayotzer. We are like the clay in the hands of the potter. It's based on Pasuk in Yirmiyahu. The term chomer signifies in reality the material of glass, which when broken can be refounded and made whole as before. Fear not, men of Israel, they being the tree of life. For since the children have engrafted themselves on the tree of life, they will arise from the dust and will be established in the world as one united people to worship the Holy One, blessed be he, in harmony with the words that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And that's the end of the paragraph in the Zohar. So it occurs to me that the Zohar, and I believe this is what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is referring to, because as we all know, he was a proto-Kabbalist, so he was very much in touch and in tune with much of the text of the Zohar, even though the Zohar had not yet been published formally yet. Rabbi Yehuda Levi is alluding to the fact from this Pasuk of Tola'at Yaakov that the Jewish people have a metamorphosis awaiting them, just like, and, and that's, that's the analogy. It's, it's much more apt of an analogy than the dry bones. Because the reason why a Jew who is in a dry bone state has difficulty envisioning a future 
is because once a person in the gra- is in the grave, that's it. You need a miraculous phenomenon to bring us back to life. But a worm does not need a miracle to come back to life. A worm just has to go through a process of productivity, of producing the silk that it needs to produce in this life in its downtrodden state of just being a worm. And we have a task at hand while we're here in this world. We produce the silk, we produce the Torah, we produce the Kiddush Hashems, and we educate the world, and we're a light unto the nations, and we do all the things that we're supposed to do in this world. And then we go into our cocoon, and we have a metamorphosis. And that metamorphosis allows us to emerge on the other side as the butterfly, our destiny. And that's how a person who is pious, who sees the downtrodden state of his people, is able to come to terms with, even if you have difficulty with the the whole idea of the dry bones being resurrected, consider that we are a worm that has yet to become a butterfly. Now, if we look at it that way, I think we can also make sense of how Dayenu can help us. Dayenu is an expression of thanks to all that Hashem did for us when we were still but a worm. Now, if I have a lot of investment in a creature that has a glorious future ahead of it, why would I allow the worm that I have done so much for every step of the way of this worm's initial development from the time it was just a little larva? I've watched it grow. I've protected it. I split an ocean for it. I made all of these miracles for this worm in order to allow it to thrive and to grow. Why would I cut the worm down just before it's about to go into its cocoon and to metamorphose into a butterfly? That doesn't make sense. If we believe that there is a destiny awaiting the Jewish people that will be like a butterfly compared to a worm, then it would make no sense for Hashem to have stopped his grace and his benevolence to the Jewish people at this stage in our history would make no sense. Why would God stop and forsake us and leave us alone if if the whole reason why he took us out of Egypt was to see us become the butterfly? So therefore, when I think about, when I think about the Dayenu, and I think about all that Hashem has invested in us as a people, I cannot accept that the end result of all of that kindness and benevolence stops with me or stops with my ancestors or stops with my descendants. Can't stop here. If Hashem invested so much, he's got, he's got to be waiting for us to become the butterfly. And that's the reason why I can think back, I can hearken back to Dayenu to remind myself that there is a future for the Jewish people. There has to be a future for the Jewish people because Hashem would not have invested so much into us as a nation only to allow us to die before becoming the butterfly. That's what I think is the message that Rabbi Yudha Levi is giving to us. Now, we're still in our, we're still in the process of metamorphosis, but I think we're seeing it. We are, um, we are going through that metamorphosis uh, as we speak. I don't know how, I don't know you know, I don't know exactly how to characterize it, but there's something changing within the Jewish people. We're growing our wings as we speak, and something amazing is going to emerge. It's already it's starting to emerge. It's a slow process. Maybe not as dramatic as the, the worm to butterfly, but it takes a while. It takes a while for that gestation to take place. So that's what I think is going on over here. Any comments or questions? Go ahead, Mrs. Sachachowski. Um, those three arguments that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi brings to try to explain national suffering, really, I, they don't do anything for me. Um, because I, I always think, well, if Hashem is omnipotent and He could make anything happen, why couldn't He have done all of that in a way that wouldn't be so painful? But I'll tell you what does give me a little bit of um, 
solace, which is when I read or hear about people who are a lot smarter than me and they can come to terms with it. So I think to myself, okay, if they're a lot smarter than me and they can accept this, then there is a reason and I just don't get it. So it makes me feel better to know that they can cope with that dissonance. Do you know what I mean? I do, I do. I, I, I think that there's a lot, of, um, a lot of truth in what you're saying because... Um, I don't think that acceptance is equivalent to smartness. Go ahead, go ahead. Acceptance is not equivalent to smartness. Yeah. But if I know a very wise person who's learned how to reconcile this, even though I haven't been able to reconcile it, can that also be a source of comfort? It's beyond me. But so and so has been able to come to terms with it. So, a saintly person. What's that? A saintly person. Not just a saintly a person. person. Yeah, not just a smart a person, but a, a righteous person. Yeah. What do you, What do you think? I'm saying, of course, that could be that it could also come from a regular person on the street. It doesn't have to be a smart or a saintly person. Who knows right. to accept it. Mm. That's true, but I respect it more when I know someone is brilliant and he's thought through all of the <laughs> permutations and he, let's say the Rambam, you know, if he, if he can reconcile everything and he's so brilliant, then, you know, I'm sure this... So who do you look to in, 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 in your generation or generation, one generation ago, of great rabbis who were able to reconcile the Holocaust? I've never heard anybody say they can reconcile it. I, anything specific, like the Holocaust. You know, my bubbies and zadies don't have a reconciliation, don't understand it. But I'm saying, when I read about Chazal, <coughs> who were so brilliant and knew so much, and were able to still believe and reconcile it with all the evil that they saw in the world, it makes me feel better. Like. You know, if they can do it, then I can believe that it's out there. Okay, so not necessarily specifically pointing to any specific historical event, but just in general, coming to terms with evil. Exactly. Okay.